recording. Shabbat shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 25th of the third month, we believe, for our Creator's calendar as we reckon it. And I'm sorry for any mistakes or mishaps that we might have. I'm currently not at home. So, uh, but we, we do appreciate you being here. It happens to line up with July 6th on the Gregorian calendar for 2024. And today we're taking a little break from our current reading through Genesis to cover a, a little topic that came up that we were sharing scriptures on for the, the purpose of Elohim and just what that might be. But without further ado, we're going to go ahead and just read the scriptures that we have here and Father willing through our beloved son or his beloved son, our, our Mashiach, Yahushua. I hope that this is edifying for everyone. So this is just a comment that we had and then the scriptures that were being shared this morning. It says, Shabbat Shalom, family and friends. May your day be filled with all pleasing to the one who made us, loves us, and has called us according to purpose. And I've mentioned a few times the purpose of Elohim in a few scriptures. So I thought to put them together here, and that's what we're going to be covering. This first section is from 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. And it says, For in or sorry, for we know that if the tent of our earthly house is destroyed, we have a building from Elohim, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the Shamayim. For indeed in this we groan, longing to put on our dwelling, which is from the Shamayim, so that having put it on, we shall not be found naked. For indeed, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we desire to put it off, but to put on, so that what is to die might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this same purpose is Elohim, who has given us the Ruach as a pledge of what is to come. And the Ruach being the comforter and the seal, right, it manifests in the fruits or what we call character traits of our behavior in reformed, in, in a reformed condition, right? No longer lying, cheating, stealing, maliciously contriving things that others, you know, to be hurtful, to do to someone else what we would not want done to us, Right. But that whole purpose is what we're called for. The next section is from Romans 9, 11 through 16. Oh, and for context, if anyone's not aware, when our body is destroyed and we are resurrected, we're going to have a renewed body, which doesn't have any of the ailments or frailties of our current earthly body. And we each will have our own body esteemed uniquely, just as the stars are all unique in themselves. They all have their own amount of light and how they shine in, in this firmament up there. Everyone else is going to get their reward according to you know, how they live this life. But this is right here in Romans. Yet before they were born or had, had done any good or evil in order that the purpose of Elohim according to choice might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the greater shall serve the lesser, as it has been written, Yaakov I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And just for context here, this part isn't directly talking about us. This is talking about individuals, our forefathers that lived before us and things that had happened. But what they represent prophetically does apply, right? For the third age in which we're living and what Esau represents in a foretelling manner is what we call Roman Catholicism. The one born in the womb with the renewed covenant times yet rose up to persecute his brother. Very simple picture of what you can call the Catholic Christianity, okay? <clears throat> so there, there is a remnant or an element of connection there. But the purpose of sharing this is that he's not changing. And when he calls someone 
for his purpose according to choice, it's always going to be that way because he doesn't do things contrary to himself. And then that's the purpose of the text, just so that we're not confused on why it was being shared. So I'll go ahead and say it again. Yet before they were born or had done any good or evil, in order that the purpose of Elohim according to choice might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it is said to her, the greater shall serve the lesser. As it has been written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What then shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with Elohim? Let it not be. For he says to Moshe, I shall favor whomever I favor, and I shall have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then, it is not of him who is desiring, nor of him who is running, but of Elohim who shows favor. And then this next section right here is from Hebrews 6, or Ibri, right? Ibri 6, 13 through 20. This is for Elohim, having promised Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, swore by himself. Truly, or amen, baraka, in barakah, I shall barak you, or blessing, I shall bless you, and increasing, I shall increase you. And so after being patient, he obtained the promise. For men do indeed swear by the one greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In this way, Elohim, resolving to show even more clearly to the heirs of promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, confirmed it by an oath, so that by two unchangeable, in which it is impossible for Elohim to lie, we might have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the expectation set before us, which we have as an anchor of the life, both safe and firm, and entering into that within the veil, where Yahushua has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high Kohen forever according to the order of Melchizedek, or King of Righteousness. And in the parables that are in that is the essence of what this purpose is that we're going to see here in just a moment. But not to leave anyone in suspense or anything, because I don't like to do that. He promised that the seed of Abraham would be Baruch and increased, and that his purpose would stand through them, through which our Mashiach came, and he came to set the example that he wanted us to follow so that we could be with him where he is. And I actually didn't share the very one that, uh, we'll have to look up the verse here in a minute, but the purpose of Elohim that I had mentioned, I quoted it right here, who loved us and called us according to purpose, but I didn't actually quote the scripture where that was at, so I'll find that one in the meantime. The next one here we were sharing and having a different conversation as well so i'm sorry about that it's not not that it's not important but it didn't have to do with what we were talking about directly it was a question from our brother right here this is the fulfillment of his purpose or the reward that he's given to us from it so ob willing after we see this you'll you'll see exactly what that purpose is and then it's even it's even more plainly stated where we haven't covered it yet. So that's a treat for everyone. But right here, this is from Chazon or Revelation, chapter 19, starting at verse 11 and going through to chapter 20, verse 6. And just as later on, when you see it in the book of Yahukanon, after he's gathered his taught ones that have been with him through his trials, right before his being the... Uh, Pesach offering for us, right? He says that he's speaking to them plainly and no longer in parables. And then he's going to return to the one who sent him just as it was foretold by the foretellers that the word that proceeded from him shall go forth and not return void, right? And then they say, ah, well, now we now you speak plainly and we know that you know all. 
because then they knew exactly who was talking to them. In the same capacity, here at the end of Revelation, when he's speaking to his people, it, this is quite plain. This isn't in a parable, this first part. There is some astronomical dating, it looks like, in here. And if you don't know what that means, I highly recommend for everyone, no matter how studied you are in Scripture, to go look up the YouTube series from the channel ChristmasIsALie.com. And the, the playlist series is called Antichrist for Dummies. It's got over 60 videos in it. It goes over every single chapter of Revelation. It goes through the original language of it, breaks down the literal and accurate translations of anything that is not accurately translated in the English, which is quite, quite a bit, especially in the KJV. But it goes through the accurate translation of the, the original text and then the fulfillment of it in history, all the way from when the seals were first happening before Yahu Kanan's time. He was opening up things that had already been passed. He was unsealing things that had happened from the time of Vast Basin and the four, four horses, the four emperors, all the way through to our very times and beyond. They're now covering the bull judgments and what's happening after them, the drying up of the Euphrates, a, a very phenomenon happening during our days, not yet fully culminated. And what that represented is also covered here, along with all of history in between. But most of us have been led to believe Jesuit theology, theology excuse me, in regard to these topics, and they don't know what's actually true. But they watch television and they watch movies, and they listen to these people that are lying to them and pushing billions of dollars worth of a narrative to get them to believe things that aren't real when he's laid it down already, if we would just go back to what was said. So enough of that, though. At this point, he's speaking plainly, and um, you can see that. So this is the culmination of that purpose of Elohim right here. It says, And I saw the Shamayim opened, and there was a white horse, and he who sat on him was called trustworthy and true, and in righteousness he judges and fights. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, having a name that had been written which no one had perceived except himself, and having been dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yahuwah. Literally, our Mashiach is called the Word of Yahuwah all throughout the original covenant writings. That is one of many names or titles that are used in conjunction to him. He is also, the um, in the English translations where it says, the set-apart one of Israel, or the Kadosh one of Yisrael, if you're looking at the Hallelujah Scriptures, if you actually look at the Hebrew, one of is not in the text at all. It just says Kadosh Yisrael, or the Kadosh, the set-apart Israel, or the set-apart one who strives with men and Elohim and overcomes. And he, that's a code, every time it's talking about that, it, and he even mentioned that as our Yahuwah, right? That is our Mashiach who is the one, the only true Israel, if you will, because he's the perfect man. There's no one like him on earth. There's no created being equal to him. So, um, but the titles that you can see throughout scripture, this being one of them, it's the word of Yahuwah who appeared and spoke with all the foretellers from Moshe down, even before it was the voice of Yahuwah and the word of Yahuwah that spoke to Abram that was with Adam in the garden. And that is a code name for our Mashiach. So this is the identification of that right here. And even when people read this, they, they don't quite get what they're reading all the time. There's a reason for that we're not going to get into, but this is what it's telling you. Other names for him, like I mentioned, are the Kadosh Yisrael or the set-apart Israel. Um, oh, now I'm drawing a blank. It, when we get to them, I'll cover them to you, but there are specific things or titles that he's called 
And then there's titles that the Father is called. He is El Shaddai, or the Father above is the supreme, the only true Elohim, as Scripture says, right? But our Mashiach is an Elohim unto the people because he created all things by the will of the Father. Just as he sent Moshe like an Elohim unto Pharaoh, because he's only able to do the things that he sees and say what he hears. So as he was made an Elohim, so he's able to do so. Just like he said, always consistent with himself, trustworthy unto the truth, right? Not to be confusing, but just to help anybody who might be a little confused on these topics. And there is quite a bit of that, tragically. Kavod Yahuwah. Oh, that's thank you, brother. So another title or one is Kavod Yahuwah or Kavod Yahuwah, the esteem of Yahuwah as it's mentioned, or Yahuwah of esteem as it's mentioned in the English translations. Whenever you see Yahuwah of esteem, it's really Kavod Yahuwah, and that is always a title for our Mashiach because he is the one who Elohim was in who esteemed him. Elohim manifested bodily, and he's the one that was visibly esteemed amongst the people in every capacity from the beginning on. So thank you for that. There might be more as well, and we can cover them as we go through in the course of time, but um, Father willing, like I said, this will be edifying, and people can see these things and not just believe, but confirm it. Read these things for yourself. It's right there in what we call the Bible or the scriptures, if you will. And then you can find the confirmation of these things plainly spoken in the hidden writings for everyone that looks for them. And that's the great way that you can really know that they are true because they confirm the things that you can have all throughout the rest of the scriptures. This is in the armies in the Shamayim dressed in white linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress, or the vat, of the fierceness of the wrath of El Shaddai. And on his robe and on his banner he has a name written, King of Kings and Master of Masters. And I saw one messenger standing in the sun, when you want to really know what happens to the, the kings and the, the masters and the land owners and all these people that are oppressing others, it's given in explicit detail in the book of Hanok or what they call First Enoch in the end chapters, both what happens to them during the millennial reign and what they're allowed to come up to do once in a while from the darkness of where they're going to be. But he is king of king and master of masters, and those that are highly exalted and the things that are made great in this earth are abomination to him, just as he said. So, but he says, And I saw one messenger standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in mid heaven or mid Shamayim, Come and gather together for the supper of the great Elohim and eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of strong ones, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and the, their armies gathered together to fight him who sat on the horse and his army. And I, I referenced the war scroll for the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's an allusion to the times of Yahushua, the son of Nun, when he brought the children into the land and what was done there. That was a type and shadow of what is going to be happening here when he returns to establish his millennial reign. The beast being the Roman Empire, okay? The, the, the beast is synonymous with the king of it. But, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, that would be the Eastern Orthodox patriarch, the, the two legs or the two authorities, the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth, not as, not as mentioned by what is believed by SDA, for example, the Seventh-day Adventists, 
where they attribute the false prophet to America. And again, there's a lot of information that's being pushed, lots of money spent to have that kind of narrative believed. Just like the, the, just like the belief that the mark of the beast is some vaccine or some microchip under your skin. None of that is real. None of that is true. None of this future stuff is legitimate. In reality, the mark, the, the mark, the X mark on the hand or on the forehead of those worshiping in the false religious system started happening thousands of years ago. It's, we call it Lent, Ash Wednesday. It's literal. It's not literally everyone, but it's all kinds. And it's one of the three signs mentioned in Revelation of those that are partakers of that kingdom. But a lot of people, we don't comprehend these things well because we have been taught for a very long time things that aren't true. So again, I recommend that for anyone. But getting back on point, the beast and the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he led astray those who received the mark of the beast and not right and those who worship his image there's two things right right even there okay and the two were thrown alive into the lake of fire burning with sulfur and so they immediately get the punishment of everlasting fire while they're still alive thrown down into hell a remnant reminiscent of korok's rebellion in the wilderness where you had sons of Louis, those that were set apart, appointed to serve our creator, who were apostate from Moshe, for context of what this is talking about. <clears throat> they immediately go down alive into the lake of fire. But the rest were killed, and you also see a parable of this in Second Baruch, in Fourth Ezra, the three-headed eagle and what happens to it. But in Second Baruch, you have the parable of the forest with the vine and, and the waters. The vine being our Mashiach and the waters being the people's, the, the forest being the Roman Empire and the little horn that's reigning at that time, right? Mm -hmm. The beast and the kings of the earth that gave power unto the beast, as mentioned earlier, that happened previously in history when our pagan Hebrew paganized ancestors, the Germanic hordes sacked Rome. They took it over and broke it into 10 kingdoms, three of which were uprooted because they were non-Trinitarian, the Lombard kingdom being the last of those, and they were in Italy. And after that third horn was uprooted, it brought the temporal power of the papacy to full culmination. This was foretold in scripture literally spoken of as what would be the restrainer by Tertullian and others. It was directly mentioned it was the Roman Empire. Once it was broken up, that would make the way for the, the little horn to become manifest. And again, I'm not trying to overwhelm people with a lot of this stuff, but it's important we have proper context that when we read these things, we know what it's talking about. And then you're not going to be confused by all this other winds of doctrines and things that just aren't true. But you can prove all this, and if you go and study those videos, not just listen to them and and believe it, but prove them out. Look at the stars, see that they were actually where he says they were at those very dates, and look at the history, see what actually happened, study it for yourself, get confirming witnesses, and then you'll know it's true, and you won't be confused by these things that are going on. But back on point, proper comprehension. That's the only reason why I'm mentioning this to you, and I'm taking the time to try to show you where you can see and confirm it for yourself. Because reading these things without knowing what it's really talking about doesn't help. But this is his purpose, and this is the truth of what will be. Okay? So again, you can see parables of the, his overthrow and what's going to happen. His entire people is going to be destroyed, and he will be rebuked last and then killed. Right? as you see, tossed in the lake of fire here. But it says, And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, meaning according to the law. The sword of his mouth is the Torah. Okay? It's sharper than any two-word sword, dividing even to the marrow and bone 
and of spirit and ruach, or of ruach and nefesh, of spirit and soul, if you will. And it says, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Okay. And I saw a messenger coming down from the Shamayim, having the key of the pit of the deep, or the the abysmo, the bottomless well, they call it. And that's another false translation, but the key of the abyss, which has to do with the, the keys of the catacombs, where the papal authority, they say they have the keys of the, the church, right? The literal architecture from looking from the top down, like from a hot air balloon or from our creator looking down on them. The whole building of the Vatican area looks like a key. It's because they, they try to do this in, in mockery. They, they literally try to fulfill the things that are there on purpose while deceiving people. It's part of the Nicolaitan doctrines from the, the Gnostic fathers, the Eastern fathers from Egypt or whatever, the desert fathers, that's what they call them. But you can find this information from the Nag Hammadi Library. And again, the Antichrist for Dummies videos covers these things where you don't have to dig into the garbage yourself. You can listen to someone else who's done the study and he shows you the references. You not you don't just have to believe what they say and you can you can see it, right? But either way, the key of the pit of the abyss or the catacombs and a great chain in his hand and he sees the dragon, the serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit of the deep and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should lead the nations no more astray, until the thousand years were ended. And after that he has to be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Don't you know that you shall judge messengers? Shoal mentions to the people in his epistle, and then we have the actual foretelling of that, the direct reference where it's plainly written in the animal apocalypse of the book of Hanok, or what we call First Enoch, that after the culmination of all these things, when he sets up thrones for judgment, the first ones he's going to judge at that time is going to be the, the messengers that went apostate, and then they're going to get their eternal reward. But that, that part's not important. Anyways, there's a type and shadow of these, and you see judgment will be given to them where we will judge everything living at that time. And those that are found, like the Canaanites that made a covenant with Yahushua, the son of Nun, in the land, you're going to have a type of people during that time. Those that are his, there's going to be a time where you can't make mistakes anymore. you got to get it right. And this is an example you see throughout his word, throughout history, those that know are expected to do if you and you're you're corrected when you don't if you don't know it's not held against you in the land that those people made a covenant and while it was a negative thing for them it's positive for us the enjoyment there and what's foretold is even when he's here when yahushua returns and judgment is being administered on the world that all flesh that is sinning is going to die there will be people in the enemy's camp that's going to repent. And at that time, he's not going to punish them. Those are the ones that are going to be what we call mortal still during the millennial reign. The ones that are like the servants, the woodcutters and the water gatherers for his children that was typified in the millennial reign that was picked, uh, pictured in the reign, the, the kingdom of Solomon or Shalomo when you can read about in Kings and Chronicles where the men, the, the children didn't serve. They didn't do hard labor. They were kings and mil They were leaders and princes. They ruled, right? So that was the picture here, like the millennial reign, as you can see right here. And all of these things are types and shadows, like I was mentioning, for our edification and knowledge so that we can know what will be. Anyways, and he says, And the lives of those who had been beheaded because of the witness they bore to Yahushua, and because of the word of Elohim, and who did not worship the beast, nor his image, 
There is no form of image that we are to look upon and call our Creator or our Mashiach, especially not the Father. Please, please don't do that. Okay. And they did not receive his mark upon their foreheads or upon their hands, and they lived and reigned with Mashiach for a thousand years. They lived and reigned, right? As kings and priests. Okay. This is the whole point, and this is his purpose, uh, as we'll get to here. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Ashray, or prosperous, happy, confirmed, blessed, can, strengthened, walking straight. Right? Ashray is the and set apart, is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death possesses no authority over these. But they shall be Kohanim of Elohim and of Mashiach and shall reign with him a thousand years. So they'll be Melchizedek with him at that time. That is the purpose that is being set up right here that we've been covering, that we will be conformed to him, his image, and will reign with him, will be with him where he is, sitting on thrones, right? What he said to his twelve, not everyone gets the same level of benefit not everyone was able to see him in the flesh and walk with him to eat and dine with him those that were worthy did so those that are living now were appointed to the things we have now just as moshe was then but all of his chosen will be with him where he is right we'll, we'll all conform to that for uh, a little bit more confirmation here and this is the last bit i believe we have on this section we have Luke chapter 22, verse 27 through 30. And these are just things to confirm that, that the purpose of Elohim is for men to be made like our Mashiach, to enter into the millennial reign, not just to live forever after the judgment, but the millennial reign, because that one is the one that guarantees that the second death has no power over you meaning that after Satan is released, you will not fall to temptation. It won't even be a thing for you. Others will not have that benefit. Because the ones that are mortal, that have him imprisoned for a thousand years, that's the time that Scripture says that the thief that dies at a hundred years will be lightly honored, but the child dying at a hundred will be terribly mourned, right? Uh, it, People will be living, as it mentions in Yobelim, upwards to a thousand years again. Because sin will not be so prevalent. And men living righteous lives and will be like our patriarchs way before, like Adam and his ilk. They lived for hundreds and hundreds of years because they weren't wallowing in so much wickedness that's so prevalent in our lives today. <clears throat> They'll put no matter of evil before their eyes and they will reap the benefits of doing so, literally. But right here, Luke 22, 27 through 30, it says, For who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am in your midst as the one who serves. But you are those who have remained with me in my trials, and I covenant for you, as my Father covenanted for me a kingdom, to eat and to drink at my table in my kingdom, and to sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Yisrael. Yisrael, excuse me. So right there, that is the whole point. These are again confirmations of the fact of what his purpose is as we were just sharing. And it says <clears throat> right here, the book of Hebrews or Ivri, Avrit as they say in the modern Hebrew or Avri, right? Chapter 2, verse 10 through 18, it says, For it was fitting for him, because of whom all are, and through whom all are, in bringing many sons to esteem, to make the prince of their deliverance perfect through sufferings. All right. For both he who sets apart and those who are being set apart are all of one. Father, let them be one as we are one. Okay, not literally, not physically, not in some duality or trinity, but of the same disposition. 
of the same opinion, of the same house, right? For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I shall announce your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I shall sing praise to you. Now right here, Yahushua is being equated to a brother to us. All right? And again it says, I shall put my trust in him. And again, I see I and the children whom Elohim gave me. So now he's being equated to the one who has children that Elohim gave to him. And this would be the identification from Yeshayahu 50, uh, was it 53? Where it's the father of the future age, where he will be a father unto the children, and we will be his children, because he's laboring over us even now. <clears throat> All of these things true, and he's not the father himself, but the father is the one through whom all fatherhood is called. And like the father is a father, our Mashiach is identified as one in scripture as well. Just like he is an Elohim, and he made others an Elohim, right? So he put Moshe as a type over the children, just as he was set over. It's the same kind of pattern. Once you see these pictures, it's so it's so childlike simple to do so. The more you do, the easier it gets. This is therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself similarly shared in the same, so that by means of his death he might destroy him having the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver those who throughout life were held in slavery by fear of death. For doubtless he does not take hold of messengers, but he does take hold of the seed of Abraham. So in every way he had to be made like his brothers in order to become a compassionate and trustworthy high Kohen in matters related to Elohim, to make atonement for the sins of the people. And if you want a wonderful witness on just how that atonement was literally accomplished on the Ark of the Covenant, I highly recommend everyone to find the documentaries from Ron Wyatt and all the related videos. There's others that were done after him. There's a YouTube channel called The Ark Files, and it, it's about the Ark of the Covenant and the discoveries that were done by Ron Wyatt in that regard. Wonderful things. It goes into history and, and the things all the way um, even preceding Ron White's times by over a century, where a man in the 1800s mentioned that the Ark of the Covenant was in that area, although he himself was not the discoverer of it. So um, anyways, if you look at his stuff, it'll prove that his blood literally dropped on there when he was an offering for sins. So, and it's a rather amazing thing. That will be revealed, by the way, once they try to push these Sunday laws again. Um, in if you look at some of his later videos, he mentions it as the mark of the beasts, or, or he mentions it as something that it was not, and in a deathbed confession, which was also released, it's not something that is hidden, he made known that he it was not what was revealed by the messengers. They said the Sunday law. It was very explicit. When they make the Sunday law, the Ten Commandments that were written by the finger of our Mashiach will become known in public. The recording that he made back in the 80s will be shared with everyone so that you can see that it's the Sabbath written by his finger that is the eternal day, and no law of a man should be kept. But that's for the future if such a thing happens. He said that when the Sunday law is instituted, the Ark and the Ten Commandments and the things that he found will also become public for the benefit of men it has not been allowed to happen yet and the things that you can see that are known the the evidence of the things that he was able to share can prove to any simple mind that he's not a liar i don't think it was in his nature to to be um deceptive in that capacity <clears throat> but everyone you should judge things according to what you see and hear 
as it relates to his word and people's character, not just what I'm telling you. Either way, it says, For in what he had suffered, he himself being tried, he is able, able to help those who are tried. There's so much more in here, but it's not the point of what we're reading. The point is the purpose of Elohim, right, is that we conform to the likeness of his son, who was made perfect through sufferings. And all of us, since the time he came, the kingdom of Elohim has suffered, right? The martyrs, literally what the witnesses were the ones that were persecuted as a witness to the truth during the time in which the truth was dead, his body given up to the, the grave. Now the truth is returning, and we're going to see the benefits of that manifesting in his body in the world. This is what we're living through. For anyone that has any doubts about the confirmation of the facts that I'm talking about, how all these things tie together, the creation account parable, what he walked out in his Passion Week, everything always fitting with what you see and hear, and then in particular, with what was written in regard to it. He says he speaks in parables. He tells us how these things work. All we have to do is believe him like a child. And we can comprehend these things. But it says, <clears throat> I already read that part right here. And here's the last one that I have on here, I believe. It says, beloved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that is coming upon you to try you as though some unusual matter has befallen you. But as you share Mashiach's sufferings, rejoice in order that you might rejoice exultingly at the revelation of his esteem. What we just read in Revelation 19, when he's coming, right? If you are reproached for the name of Mashiach, you are Baruch, because the Ruach of esteem and of Elohim rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. On your part, but on your part, he is praised. By your reasonable worship, submitting your life to a trustworthy creator. All right, we're just about to read that. <clears throat> it says, For do not let any of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or doer of evil, or as a meddler, uh, a gossip or a busybody, right, what they call them. But if one suffers being Christian, it was they translate that as Christian in most English translations. It was originally Christian, one letter difference, and the Nicolaitans would later come through the Greek manuscripts and change that letter to say Christian to promote calling them Catholic Christians as opposed to anything else. The um the original text does say Christian, and a Christian for context, historical context here, the Christians were the good men. They were pagans following a, a pagan deity, doing good deeds and all these different things. But um, they weren't necessarily morally bad people. They were just confused in their weighty, in their religion on who to serve. But because of their general disposition of being known as good men, the association was put onto these ones, but used as a derogatory term to say that they were just these pagans and because they didn't worship the same way Rome did. That was its use and why it was considered a bad thing. Again, it was later put as Christian, and Christian was adopted, officially mandated in the Theodosian Codex by Sixtus III, who became, I think it was the 44th or the 45th overseer of the Roman Assembly. He was the third Sixtus to reign in that capacity, and he was the one foretold in Revelation as, six, the, the, as the 666 who established the Mark of the Beast Lent on Ash Wednesday, incorporating the Tammuz worship. He who established the worship of the abomination of desolation, which was the Christ Mass on December 25th, and put forward the canon law, then established as the Theodosian Codex, for these rules on what to call them, Catholic Christians, the belief in the Trinity, and the keeping of these pagan festivals. 
literal fulfillment at that time, not a future thing at all. But most of us don't know this. So it was tampering of the text by them to change it to Christian to hide this fact. But when you look at the etymology of Christian, you can still see the comparison there of that they think it's a derogatory thing. Christianos um, in the, the Latin or French is related to a Cretan in English. And you can just look up Cretan etymology and you should be able to find that still. And this isn't to be insulting to anyone who calls himself a Christian because I believed myself to be one and it's what we're called right here as a derogatory thing it was foretold to be so i'm not i'm not trying to to say anything or whatever i personally don't go by that anymore because it for he foretold that we would no longer be known by that name in, in one point just as we'd all get the hebrew again so i try to use the hebrew words as much as i possibly can in relation to his things that he set apart and said don't don't do these things like the nations do in relation to me but um I'm not overly against that. If you want to be specific, we're followers of the way or the Nazarene, the Nazarene, right? The branches, as he is the vine and we are the branches. Those are legitimate and actual uses in scripture and early history of what his believers were called. Shaul mentions that he was a follower of, a way, of the way, what they call a sect. And the way was of those people that were in Damascus also. It's also mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, just so you're aware. And then um, there was a writing from an early Catholic person about early beliefs and, and heresies and different things that were going on. And he mentions that the, the sect of the Nazarenes were the continuation of the the Jewish believers, as it's put, who, when the Romans came in at the foretelling of our Mashiach and they were surrounded by their enemies, they left and they went to Petra and they were over there while Yerushalayim was destroyed by Tadis and Vespasian. And they stayed, um, they stayed over there and it was the, the disciples children. It was the taught one's ancestors. It was the believers that came from Yerushalayim that left. They were there until they were completely wiped out by Rome by the end of the 7th century, is from what the uh, Antichrist for Dummies makes mention of. There are literal seed of Dawid, the descendants living today, the fulfillment of his perpetual uh, children on the throne over the children of Israel is a covenant still being fulfilled today. But the literal descendants or the direct related family of him that were known and believers were hunted down and killed. So it was foreshadowed in Vespasian and Titus and Domitian in the things that they walked out in their lives. It was done in a larger scale later on by the by Roman general. Just like you can see the patriarchs and what they walked out a later uh, fullness in their children it's the same thing for with the movement with the reformation in martin luther in in europe and then johann calvin in britain you had the movements uh, the foreshadowing of the the reformation in europe and then its culmination in britain as well and what would happen to them how they behaved and what happened in those countries later on were foreshadows of the same thing so that kind of thing is how reality functions because that's what his word shows us he, he does, right? The same can be seen if you're familiar with your own family history with like people who came to America. What happened in the beginnings would generally give you an idea of what's going to be going on later on. So that's why I think it's important to know accurate history in chronological order. Back on point here, it says, But if one suffers being Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him esteem Elohim in this matter, because it is time for judgment to begin from the house of Elohim. And if, firstly, from us, what is the end of those who do not obey the Besorah, or good news of, 
of Elohim. And, quote, if the righteous one is scarcely delivered, where shall the wicked and sinner appear? This is in the Proverbs in the Septuagint version. It's not in the Masoretic text. So then those who suffer according to the desire of Elohim should commit their lives to a trustworthy creator in doing tov. So um, that's all we had on that section. There is one more I need to find real quick. If you give me just one moment. All right, and here's the last two sections. I'm sorry, it's not quite edited right. I was really trying to hurry to get it on there. Um, I didn't want to take too long, but we'll correct it for later. And anyone that wants to, you can look these up for yourselves and read it in whatever translation you happen to have on hand. Okay, so here's the text in question that first came to mind and then what all the other ones were supporting to try to answer the question of what his purpose is. So this is from Romans 8, 27 through 30, and it says, And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Ruach is, because he makes intercession for the Kodeshim according to Elohim. And we know that all work together for Tov to those who love Elohim, to those who are called according to purpose. To his is added it's in italics in some translations, but it's not really in the text. So it says, to those who are called according to purpose. And that purpose is what we were discovering in the text here, right? Because those whom he knew beforehand, he also ordained beforehand to be conformed to the likeness of his son, for him to be the firstborn among many brothers, which was quoted earlier, right? how he's both a brother or a father in whatever will. Oh, my screen got kicked, huh? Just a moment. Sorry about that. I lost my, I got bumped and brought back. Just one moment. The screen will pop back up. So anyways, just as he came as a brother or he his being made as a father to the children, he condescends himself for our benefit. He came down and diminished himself to benefit all of the, the people he created. Okay? And it says, And whom he ordained beforehand, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also declared right, and whom he declared right, these he also esteemed. And that esteem is in earthly vessels, so that it's not of us, but of him, right? As it's mentioned in elsewhere. And then the last text, this is where it's not in what we call the Bible, but it is in the apocryphal writings. It was amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is the section that plainly states that his purpose was that he had made things for the seed of Abraham for keeping the millennial reign or what he calls the Sabbath, just like we've been sharing here, right? This is from Yobelim or <clears throat> uh, Jubilees chapter 2, starting at verse 19 here. It says, And he said to us, Behold, I will separate unto myself a people from among all the peoples, and these shall keep the Shabbat day. All right? And I will set them apart unto myself as my people, and will barak them as I have set apart the Sabbath day, and do set it apart unto myself. Even so will I barak them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their Elohim. And I have chosen the seed of Jacob from amongst all that I have seen, and I have written him down as my firstborn son, and have sanctified or set him apart unto myself, Le'olam wa'ed, or forever and ever. And I will teach them the Shabbat day, that they may keep the Sabbath or Shabbat thereon from all work. And thus he created therein a sign in accordance with which 
they should keep Shabbat with us on the seventh day, to eat and to drink and to barak him who created all things, as he has baruch and set apart unto himself a peculiar people above all peoples, and that they should keep Sabbath together with us, with the messengers of the presence and his uh, messengers of set-apartness, both in the Shamayim and on earth, for context. And he caused, and, and these are the ones that will be of the first resurrection in the millennial reign. The whole point, the purpose of Elohim. And he caused his commands to ascend as a sweet savor acceptable before him all the days. There were two and twenty heads of mankind from Adam to Jacob, and two and twenty kinds of work were made until the seventh day. This is Baruch and Kodesh, and the former also is Baruch and Kodesh. It's blessed and set apart. So just what he said the seed of Abraham would be. By keeping the Sabbath, a foreshadow of that millennial reign that we want to enter into, to which the second death will have no power over you. So, just something to consider. And the former also are Baruch and Kodesh, and this one serves with that one for sanctification and Baraka, or set-apartness and Baraka. We went over Yobelim chapter 2 and the parable of the creation account and how it was foretelling literal history throughout time. Mike isn't working. I was bumped again. I'm waiting for it to start saying it's recording. Sorry about that. I'll go ahead and start sharing the screen again, too. Uh, it, it's not actually saying, but I think it might be. So, sorry about that. The screen is sharing again. It's uh, in the process of loading. But as I was saying, we had gone over Yo Belim, or the Book of Jubilees, Chapter 2, and the creation account parable, and how that was fulfilled. <laughs> Richard's now the host. <laughs> Sorry about that. Takes the pressure off me. Sorry about that. Are you here? Can you hear me? We're here. Okay. So, it for whatever reason, it's not wanting me to continue. It keeps kicking me off every time I try to share my screen. But it does say that it's recording. I'll try one more time and we'll we'll finish it up. But just for everyone's benefit, we've already shared the creation account parable in... Yobelim or Jubilees chapter 2 in a previous recording for the on the scripture studies in the YouTube channel if you want to check that out so we're really not trying to get into that here in detail but the whole purpose again is to show this is where it was plainly written his purpose for his creature the whole point of everything he's doing like every all of creation was made for his chosen it was to get us not just for the forever after but to the millennial reign specifically to keep his sabbath and i think that's something that's a treasure that a lot of us might not be aware of so if i can real quick no it's not going to happen sorry it won't let me share but um as soon as it starts recording again i'll finish up real quick okay All right, sorry about that, you guys. My internet is not the best right now. I'm actually on vacation and not even at home. So I'm in California. But um, for the rest of what was in Chapter 2 there, Yo Belim, or I'll just finish it if you can hear me. We were on verse 24, and it says, And to, his, and to this, Jacob and his seed... It was granted that they should always be the Baruch and, and set apart ones of the first testimony in Torah, even as he had set apart in Baruch the Sabbath day on the seventh day. 
He created the heavens and earth and everything that he created in six days, and Yahuwah made the seventh day set apart for all his works. Therefore he commanded on its behalf that whoever does any work thereon shall die, and that he who defiles it shall surely die. Wherefore do you command the children of Yisrael Sorry about that. It keeps kicking me. Can you hear me all right now? Yes. All right. Thank you. If I just, if we can't finish it right here, if it keeps kicking me, you all have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath and a wonderful week ahead. I'd suggest you finish reading or just reread the entire chapter of uh, two for Yo Belim. And if not, um, then hopefully this will be edifying. But I'll finish this if I can. If not, we'll see you next week. We were right here on chapter 26. It says, Wherefore, do you command the children of Yisrael to observe this day that they may keep it set apart and not do thereon any work and not to defile it as it is more set apart than all other days? All right, and whoever profanes it shall surely die, and whoever does thereon any work shall surely die eternally. That the children of Yisrael may observe this day throughout their generations and not be rooted out of the land. For it is a set-apart day and a Baruch day. Now, you keep it so you won't die eternally, meaning you'll be in the millennial reign, the second death will have no power over you, and the children were observing it in the land so they wouldn't be rooted out. And it was literally for the amount of time they were disobedient, for the same they were taken out year for year on not keeping the Sabbath for the kingdom of Yahudah. That's why he mentioned it was 70 years for them before they were allowed to return so that the land could keep its rests, right? And the millennial reign is so that the entire world can keep its, its land Sabbath. It says, for it is a set-apart day and a Baruch day, verse 28. And everyone who observes it and keeps Sabbath thereon from all his work will be set apart in Baruch throughout all days like unto us. Declare and say to the children of Israel the Torah of this day, both that they should keep Shabbat thereon, and that they should not forsake it in the error of their hearts, that it is not lawful to do any work thereon which is not, or which is unseemly, to do thereon their own pleasure, and that they should not prepare thereon anything to be eaten or drunk meaning you prepare your food the day before, right? Or even in the night before sunrise, as it says the wise woman's to rise up and do, right? It says, therefore, there, I'm sorry, that they should not prepare thereon anything to be eaten or drunk and to draw water or to bring in or take out thereon through their gates any burden which they had not prepared for themselves on the sixth day in their dwellings. Okay. And they shall not bring in nor take out from their house to house on that day. For that day is more set apart and Baruch than any Yobel day of the Yobelim. So any Jubilee of the Jubilees. On this we kept Shabbat in the Shamayim before it was made known to any flesh to keep Shabbat thereon on the earth. And the creator of all things Baruch it. But he did not set apart all peoples and nations to keep Shabbat thereon. But Yisrael alone. And this is true. In history, they were taken out of the Egypt and they were given the Torah to keep the Sabbath. It was to them alone he gave it. Before then, it was enjoined for his forefathers Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and they passed it on to their children in the writings before the Torah as it was given to them. After them, the renewed covenant is everyone of the literal 
branches, the natural and the wild that are grafted in. No different from the sojourners that went with them, uh, the uh, people of the Egyptians that sojourned with them and became known as the tribe that they dwelled with. So it's consistent pattern that you see throughout his word here. But he calls them Yisrael alone that he gave the Shabbat for, which are these people that come to him and, and, and join the millennial reign, right? It says, them alone he permitted to eat and drink and to keep Shabbat thereon on the earth. And the creator of all things Baruch this day, which he had created for Baraka and making it set apart and splendid above all days. This Torah and testimony was given to the children of Israel as a Torah forever unto their generations. All right, so um, thank you for that. I'm sorry that I couldn't keep it on the screen, but it, we were able to record that without it bogging again. You all have a wonderful Shabbat, a Shavuot Tov, and we will see you next week. Thank you for your time.